Be in the service this morning. Can we celebrate the word of God with a shout? Hallelujah. Glory. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and you can be seated. Let's get in the world wisdom for living. We're examining the relationships of the new creation. The relationships of the new creation. Amos chapter 3 verse number 3. Today we're addressing husbands. Amos chapter 3 verse number 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? So he speaks about agreement. That is before you begin to walk with someone and relate with that person closely. The kind of relationships you keep will determine a lot in your life. If you want to be a professional genius, you keep professional friends. Your inner circles will be your professional friends because you want to be a professional genius. If you want to be a strong Christian, you keep friends with strong Christians. That is just how it is. There's no magic to it. Your relationships will go a long way to determine what happens to you. It's just like somebody wants to be an engineer. And it's in the faculty of arts. How is that possible? No matter how long or how hard he tries, he cannot end up being an engineer. Because you have to be in the right place for the right kind of influence. You have to be in the right place for the right kind of influence. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20. Proverbs chapter number 13 verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Give me the amplified of that scripture. Amplified version. He who walks as a companion with wise men is wise. But he who associates with self-confident fools is a fool himself and shall smart for it. Another translation says they shall perish together. So you have to pick your friends. The Bible tells us the kind of friends we cannot keep. If you're a Christian and you are a new creation, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 tells us, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, he tells us, Ephesians 4 24, he tells us about this new man. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, put it up. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, he tells us that the new man is after God, that you put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. First John chapter 3 verse 2 tells us, now are we the sons of God. It means when you got born again, your identity has changed. So, if your identity has changed, then the kind of influence you are exposed to has to change. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 to 17. Chapter 6 verse 14 to 17. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Next verse. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement at the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out. Come out. From among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He calls you righteous because of Jesus. He calls the unbeliever unrighteous. James chapter 4 verse 4 says, you cannot be a friend of the world. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You cannot be an intimate friend with an unbeliever. So, as a child of God, you cannot be an intimate friend of an unbeliever. Talk more of thinking marriage. It's a mismatch. You cannot marry an unbeliever. Who is an unbeliever? Someone who has not accepted the gospel. Or someone who is not saved. He is a child of the devil. John chapter 8 verse 44. You are of your father the devil. Jesus talking to those who have not accepted the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. You were dead in sins and trespasses. You walked under the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom we all had our conversation. First John chapter 3 verse 10 to 12. Talks about you know the devil being the father of those who have not accepted the gospel. So, a man that has not accepted the gospel is a child of the devil. And you cannot be married to an unbeliever. We also looked at our relationship with fellow believers. We said that as born again believers, we are members of God's family. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. Ephesians 2 18 and 19. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So, we now belong to the family of God. Christians are my brethren. So, somebody who is born again is not just a member of the church. That person is your brother in Christ. Your brother in Christ. If somebody is born again, he is your brother in Christ. That's key. That's very key. That's your brother in Christ. He's not just a member of your church. He is your brother and a member of your family. We also talked about marriage. We talked about wives. We said that in marriage there are only two parties. The husband and the wife. And that instructions are needed for those of us who are women so we can understand. Marriage does not need three people. It has only two people. The husband and the wife. Not parents, not children. Only two people. So in marriage, we have two people. Husband and wife. The husband is the head. The wife is the body. So we examine that the wife should be submitted to her own husband. Her own husband. Submission is not a question of your actions. Submission begins with the way a woman sees herself. It's not a question of actions. Submission begins with the way a woman, first of all, sees herself as a wife. It's not what you do, it's how you see yourself. How you see yourself. If you see yourself as a co-fighter with your husband, you will have problems. If you see yourself as the body, your husband is the head, you will be okay. So it's not a question of actions, it's mindset, how you see yourself. That's why some people, when they leave a church, they start becoming rude to their pastor. Why? Because they were never submitted. They were just being submissive. There's a difference between being submitted and being submissive. They are not the same. They were not being submitted because if they were being submitted in the church, even when they leave, they would still have respect for that leadership. But if they were just being submissive, once they leave, that leadership loses every form of relevance where they're concerned. When you're submitted to someone, that means you see yourself in that relationship as secondary. A wife must always see herself as secondary to the husband in the relationship. She must never see herself as a partner 
in whatever you are submitted to your husband in Christ. He is the head, you are the body. We also talked about the husband. He is the man in this first service. We started talking about the husband. The Greek word man is the word ana for a male man. The husband is a man who is in charge of something. So he is in charge of the wife to take care of the wife. The husband takes care of the wife. And in the first service we established that the man has more responsibilities than the woman. In Ephesians chapter 5, brother Paul addresses women in three verses. Addresses men in seven verses. Because a man has more responsibility in the home, in the marriage than the wife. Even the instruction over the children is given to fathers, not to mothers. Look at Ephesians 5, 22 to 32 and observe where he talks to the man and where he talks to the woman. Ephesians 5. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So, ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Next verse. Next verse. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the husband is to love the wife in affection. In affection. Now, in the first service, we looked at the husband loving the wife in forgiveness. In forgiveness. Number two, we said the husband must demonstrate his love for the wife in tolerance. Tolerance. Number three, the husband in loving his wife will provide. He will provide. When you see a man who wakes up in the afternoon. He sleeps like a man in sleeping competition. Wakes up in the afternoon. He is 26 years and he's still fighting his father for a charge card. He's not ready to be a husband. Jesus said, whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give it to you. A Christian husband is a provider at home. He is a provider in his home. It is his responsibility to provide. Every husband, listen. It is your resp- God-given responsibility to provide. That is your God-given responsibility. So don't boast and say, what do you want that I have not given you? I have bought you a car. I gave you your first phone. I gave you... There's nothing special in what you are saying. In fact, that is your natural responsibility. You didn't do her a favor buying her a car. 
If she didn't have a car, the embarrassment is on your head. It's not a special favor. No. It's not a favor that you allow your wife to be using her salary for herself. No, it's not a favor. I even allow her to be using her. Should you be using her salary for her? It's not a favor. I bought you a phone, didn't I? A very good one. You, you are insulting men. Don't be embarrassing us by talking like that. That is your natural God-given responsibility. Actually, that's your office. Your office of functionality as a horse. Ban. Not horse, horse. Teaching good? <laughs> if you are not ready to do that over and over, buy a car, buy a phone, she breaks the phone, buy another one. If you are not ready to do it over and over and over, you are not fit to be a husband. By her clothes, by her shoes. Women like shoes and handbag. See that? They are even clapping for me. <laughs> How can I not know when I have four in my house? I'm a man, blessed man among women. Buy them handbags, buy them shoes. Sometimes when I travel, they will send me a list. Very long. Me that hate market. Me, I hate shopping. Not even for myself. In fact, I would rather wear the same cloth every day than go for shopping. <laughs> I don't like shopping at all. They will send me long list. Every one of them. This one's list, that one's list, that one's list. Then I will now go to shopping mall. I don't even know where to start. I'm lost. I go to women's section. I don't know where to start the list from. But I have to do it because that is what pleases my people. Then I will call the staff. Excuse me, please. Can I have some of your time? I have a list here and I'm lost. I don't know where to find it. If you can help me. Oh, sure. Why not? They'll collect the list. We'll be doing it together. I've done it over and over. Still, I don't know what to do. I still keep asking staff to help me. But the point is, that is the joy of being a husband. And the joy of being a father. Anyway, from the world, I start talking about fathers and children. But that's the joy of being a husband. That you go to the market and get things for your wife. You get things for your wife. You shop for your wife. You're not ashamed. You buy a female handbag and take it to the counter and pay. Because that's a joy. You bring it home as a gift. That's a joy. There are men that never have the privilege of shopping for a female in their life that is called by their name. You didn't hear that. Shopping for a female in their life that is called by the... I'm not saying they don't shop for females. <laughs> but they have never had the privilege of shopping for a female in their life that is called by their name. That's the joy of being a husband and the joy of being a parent or a father. A good husband shops for his wife. Get her shoe size. Get her, her clothes size. Go shop for her. It's part of it. It's not glory. It's what you ought to do. You drive a great car. Like I said in the first service. And your wife is jumping Okada. 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 Rickshaw. Keke. It makes you irresponsible. It makes you irresponsible. I know men who buy the car for the wife and they join the keke. Yes. They let the wife have the honor. Because... The glory of a husband is his wife. If the wife is well taken care of, it is an indication that the husband is a good man. All over the world is an established truth. Even people who don't know Christ know that. 
You must love as Christ loves. That's why when people are getting married in this church, we ask, what do you do for a living? How are you going to take care of this lady? And we also ask you, where do you live? We want to know your house. Don't marry and carry a fresh wife and be jumping from boy's quarter to boy's quarter looking for where to manage. No, it's not biblical, it's ungodly. Even unbelievers know better. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. But if any provide not for his own and specially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Give me the amplified version. You know, I told you I love amplified. Let's read together all of you that are able to see it. Let's go one to go. If anyone fails to provide for his relatives, especially for those of his own family, he has disowned the faith by failing to accompany it with fruits and is worse than an unbeliever who performs his obligation in these matters. Provide for his own, not provide for her own. His not her. It's not the wife that provides. It's the man that provides. Even if the lady you marry is a multi-billionaire, you are still the one that has the office of providing. It doesn't matter how much she has. If she likes, let her own the whole city. For being her husband, from your meager income, you owe God and her a responsibility to steal from that income. Provide for her. Some men marry ladies that have money so they can be lazy for life. So taking care of your wife is part of the Christian life. Is part of your Christian life. Taking care of your wife. Giving church. Sources of love. But you are not giving in your house. You give in church. You sow seeds. You bless people. But the one you do in your house is not called giving. That is your responsibility. When you give money to your wife. You are not sowing a seed. That is your obligation. That is your responsibility. That is your job. You give her money. You provide for the upkeep of the home. You pay your children's school fees. You didn't sow a seed. You are not supporting the work of God. <laughs> That's your responsibility. Say I hear you. If I'm preaching good, say I hear you. So you must provide. So if a guy is talking to you about marriage, you want to check, what do you do? Where do you walk? That's what the word of God teaches. Every husband must be a provider in his home. Number four, you must give affection. A husband must give his wife affection. Affection has to do with physical demonstration of love. Not just giving things. Your body belongs to your wife. That's a biblical obligation. So there must be affection. You must physically demonstrate your love. By your speech, by your gifts, and by your gesticulations. Very important. Some men don't know how to talk it, but they know how to do it. So whichever one, whether you want to talk it or you want to demonstrate it, you must be affectionate. Some people can talk from now till Jesus comes. Some men are so poetic that even when they are saying, let me have my food, a poem follows it. 
Let me have my food. You know, the bowl you're using for that or for that oatmeal looks like your eyeball. They are poetic in everything they do. <laughs> and there are some. <laughs> no talk, only action. The way they will hug the wife, the way they will talk to her, the way they will clean her eye, or the way they will touch her hair, or something communicates love. They are affectionate. A man must have some affection for his wife. Otherwise, there's no point to marry her. If there is nothing in her that is making you admire that you want to touch or respond to, then you didn't marry. You transacted. <laughs> because if it's marriage, it will have affection. There must be tenderness, just like Jesus. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, just like Jesus. You must be a tender person. A husband must be tender. If you didn't learn it before, learn it now. Some men will say, I don't know it, and I don't want to learn it. Mm -mm. You don't know it, learn it. Develop it, start it, grow in it. As a husband, you must practice First Corinthians 13. That is your chapter. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love does not insist on its own. Love is gentle. Love is long-suffering. All of those attributes and adjectives for love in 1 Corinthians 13 are for the husband because the husband is to love as Christ loves the church. Love suffers long. How long is long till the end of life? Patience in marriage is fundamental. And you must be patient till the end of time. Patience in marriage is fundamental. And you must be patient till the end of the age. A woman owes a man majorly character and a man owes a woman majorly responsibility so when responsibility meets with character a successful marriage is brought in. because majorly what a man owes a woman majorly is to be responsible responsible towards her in all ramification emotionally physically affectionately materially and otherwise responsible while a woman owes a husband character, submission, you know, um, uh, commitment, friendship, loyalty. When that two is together, a successful marriage is born. As the head of the marriage, a husband must demonstrate the God kind of love. You must respect your wife. A husband must respect his wife. Don't talk to her anyhow in public. Don't insult her before her children. Don't shout on her in the presence of her house helps. Husbands, are you hearing me? Don't talk to your wife in the presence of your children anyhow. Don't call her names. Respect her. Very important. Respect your wife. If you're displeased about something... Give it a bit of time. When you cool down a bit, excuse her to a private corner. I don't like what you did. And I don't want you to do that again. Okay? That's it. Don't tell her. You have started again. You have started again. And all the house helps in the house are standing at attention and coming closer. Idiot. Stupid woman like you. Witch like your mother. Ah, where is that coming from? Have you ever had Christ look at us and say, you have come again? <laughs> Christ doesn't do that. Christ doesn't do that. Even if she has done it ten times, when you're going to address it, address it as if that's the first time. Hey, I, I've told you, I don't like that. Stop it. I'm not, I'm not pleased. I'm not pleased. And you're supposed to please me. 
I'm not pleased with that. Easy. You don't have to go like, idiot. Hey! <laughs> Madam! <laughs> when you were approaching her for marriage, did you do, hey! <laughs> Madam! <laughs> you didn't do that. The way you married is the way you keep the marriage. You were tender, you were nice, you were kind, you spoke nicely. In the marriage, that's how to speak. You don't have to blow off the roof. The important thing is that you communicated what your thoughts are. You communicated your dislikes or your likes. As a husband, respect your wife. We're in a culture in Africa where African men are taught not to respect the woman. Natural African culture. And there are many men like that. And you, 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 you men in power city, you must be careful. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. Even in domestics, don't leave your wife to be the one to wash your clothes, cook your food, clean the house. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Some women have washed clothes that when they shake your hand, when they shake your hand, you will not know when you're saying, please remove the hammer from him. <laughs> you remember the hammer? <laughs> I remember years ago, a, a, a man of God came to this church to teach and he was preaching. Then he said that this old Assemblies of God man that had a misunderstanding with somebody. So he went and grabbed the person. And as he grabbed the person like this, he was hitting the back. Bah! Bah! <laughs> whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Some people came and said, what is it? He said, I beg, I beg, collect the hammer from his hand. <laughs> So the person said, no, nah, I don't see hammer for your hand. The only hand I see. <laughs> the hand is skillful in battle. <laughs> he said the hand was it. Boop. Boop. But like the hammer. <laughs> so don't use, don't let your wife develop hammer hands. The hands are so rough. That when she touches you, you are angry. Because of domestic abuse. She has washed. She has cleaned. She has cut grasses in the house. She's the one doing everything. African man. And you still sit down and say, I want pounded yam. She has pounded until her hand has become a pounder. Never mistake yourself. Let her land you a touch. That is the day you will appreciate the training the hand has undergone. A loving husband gets some house helps. Get people that will wash the clothes for you people. Pay them some money. Get people that will assist her in cooking. She doesn't have to cook all the time. Making your wife cook all the time doesn't make you a good man. Love her enough to cut her for the things that will make her comfortable. Get some house helps. Take out of your salary and pay them monthly to assist her. Because she also is involved in other responsibilities of making your home run well. Don't leave everything for her. That's not Christ-like. Jesus gave us a helper. When he, the comforter, is come, he will help you. Jesus gave us a helper. Get helpers for your wife. To help her with cook. To help her with washing clothes. Help her with home duties generally. If you can afford it. And if you cannot afford it. Sit down with her and plan out to share the home duties. You can wash all the clothes. But your own her own. And let her cook. Yes. Yes. No I'm serious. You can do the washing. Because you can't afford it. It's not our fault that you cannot afford it. Yes. So since it's not our fault, it is natural to see men washing clothes. It's natural, isn't it? 
Look around the society. You wash the clothes. Let her cook the food. Let her go to market. Let her tend for the children. Let her make sure the house is clean. Let her make sure the beddings are in place. Yes. You sit down. Or if you like cooking, then let her wash the clothes. You do the cooking. You go to market. How much is a pound of meat? <laughs> Baba Ogale in the market. <laughs> it just means that you are being Christ-like. Your mother may call you woman rapper. It's better you are a woman rapper and please Christ than you are an African man and displease Christ. You've got to look at it. Look at the home duties. Look at how busy your wife gets. And some men think, well, you know, my wife is just a housewife. It is easier to work in the office than to be a housewife. Am I communicating? It's easier to go to the office every day, sit down at the desk and sign things and write things and walk around and just be Mr. Nice Guy. Domestics at home is a whole full-time ministry. Washing, cleaning, mopping, washing clothes, washing beddings, fixing the bed, fixing the house. And God bless you that you have three boys. Oh my goodness, that woman will clean that house 20 times a day because boys are never sitting down. I'm teaching good here now. Assist if you can't afford it. Two of you sit down, look at the home duties as joint heirs of the grace of God and say, hey, you know I love you. I want us to be able to take care of our home responsibilities nicely. What and what do we do every day? Look at it. Okay, I go to work, I come back. When I come back, I'll do one, two, three to assist what you do. Yeah, that's the way it should be. Not that you come back and cross your leg. And so what have you been doing since morning? Account for the hours. I left at seven o'clock. This is five o'clock. What have you done today? No. Christ doesn't do that. Christ is a part of what we do. I am with you. When you fall, I'll be with you. When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. When you go through the water, I'll be with you. He never leaves us. A husband should not leave his wife to be involved in domestics alone. A husband should assist where he can assist. People like me that is not domesticated, I can't cook many, I can't cook anything. I can only boil water and make tea for you. That's all. But I still go to the kitchen. I still go around. Even though my presence there is to make noise. Walk around and be making noise. But at least I am there. And sometimes if I discover there's a plate that is needed, I pick the plate quickly, I bring it. If I discover it's knife they need, I carry the knife and give. I am also adding my own. I'm being a part of it. I'm supporting. I don't just sit down in the parlor, put uh, channels. Uh -huh. Buhari is not taking care of Nigeria very well. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. I go to the kitchen. I go to the kitchen. I'm a part of the house. I go around. You know, I go around. I fix things. Even though I have house helps. Yesterday I spent two hours fixing the bedroom. Fixing my clothes because my clothes were not too organized. I couldn't bring anybody to do it. So I sorted my clothes myself. Sorted them, sorted them, fixed them, fixed them, fixed them, organized them, arranged them, did everything without calling anybody to help. Why? Because I also am a member of the family and I've got to contribute my own quarter to the well-being of the house. Christ will do that. I'm teaching now. Husbands, are you here? Yes, Christ will do that. A husband ought to do that. So, like I said, if you can't afford it, then make a plan to be useful. Play the part you ought to play as a husband. We read about Sarah and Abraham. Abraham had servants who were doing a lot for him. He had servants. You've got to love your wife enough to be a part of what she does and be involved in the things she does. In Ephesians chapter 5, when you love your wife, the Bible says you love yourself because you and her are one. 
The Bible says Jesus beautifies the church and cleanses the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ. He makes the church without spot or wrinkle. It means your wife must look well. She must look well all the time. The beauty of a man is in his wife. Please, husbands, get that. Don't wear a suit and look nice and your wife is dressed like your grandmother. It shows you are, a, you are not a good man. If the money you have is for one, let it be for the wife. God gave us his only. He gave his only to us. A husband will give his only to the wife. And don't forget you are to model Jesus in that marriage. Glory to God. Take care of your wife. Your wife is your responsibility. As a Christian man, you can tell your wife, change that top. I don't like it. Wear the other one and do something about it. I don't like it. It does not bring out the best of you. Because the church brings out the glory of Christ. The wife brings out the glory of the husband. In 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 7, look at it, put it up for me. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse number 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. That your prayers be not hindered. So the husband has a responsibility to mirror Jesus in his loveliness. Deal with them or dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Underline that. That's very key. In fact, if you're making notes, write it in capital letters. Dwell with your wives according to knowledge. According to knowledge. Then note this other one. Giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. Then also take note of this one. Weaker vessel. Now, the word weaker vessel does not refer to the frailty of our body or the frailty of our emotions. Vessel, weaker vessel, refers to sacrifice. Sacrifice. That is, the weaker vessel is referring to marriage as a term to say someone who is lesser in authority than you. You are the head, she is secondary. So as secondary, her being secondary in the marriage is what the Bible means by weaker vessel. Her being secondary. A woman does not differ from a man. There's no difference. Save a marriage. There's no difference between the husband and the wife. A husband and a man and woman. We have strong men. We have strong women. We also have weak men. We have women with great voices. We have men with great voices. We have women that can fight and beat up their husbands. And even beat up men. They're there. Just like we have men that can beat up women. So the weaker vessel has nothing to do with the physical composition or emotional disability of a woman. If a woman is emotionally disabled, it's okay. We also have men who cry all the time. They cry when they are happy. They cry when they are not happy. They cry when good things happen. They cry when bad things happen. They cry when you shout at them. They cry when you praise them. There are men who cry for everything. Just like there are women too who cry for everything. Tears, tears for them is a gift. It just flows. So, weaker vessel does not refer to emotion or the make of the woman. 
it refers to the authority. That is, she is secondary to you in authority. So you dwell with them according to knowledge. Gnosis in the Greek. It means to observe someone. Observe. That means as a man, you have the responsibility to observe your wife. Observe. And in observation, take note of what works and what does not work. In observation, be intelligent. Don't be mumushious. Observe. Then when you have observed, dwell with her according to your observation. You know the things you will say that will get her angry? Avoid them. You know the things you will say that will make her happy? Engage them. You know the way to talk and she will respond well? Talk like that. You know the way you can talk now? She will catch fire. She will get angry. Avoid it. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Let me talk to you men. Every man listen to me. A time comes in your life as a man where all you need in life is peace. If you have not arrived there, you are still a boy. You will soon arrive. A time comes in your life where all you need is peace. You need peace at home. You need peace to think. You need peace to be productive. You even need peace to be healthy. And if you want peace, you must give your wife peace. Because the only person that can take peace from you is your wife. That's the only person. So give her peace. Decorate her with peace. Keep peace all over her. <laughs> Let her sleep in peace and wake up in peace. You will have peace. There's a way your wife will rattle you. Even in your office, you will become a dummy. You go to work, they say, what is your name? You say, he's coming. <laughs> Papa, I was saying, now problem. It's problem. When problem do you, they will ask you the name of your village. You will tell the name of your primary headmaster. <laughs> it's a problem. A time comes in your life where all you need is peace. Nothing is bigger than peace of mind. And if you want it, then give your wife peace. The only way you can give your wife peace is observation. Observe. Know what works and what does not work. You should know it. I'm not talking about understanding carnality. Oh, I understand my wife. I know she doesn't like praying. It is okay. No, that's not what I mean. I'm not talking of carnality. I'm talking about know her as a person. Know her person. Know what works and what does not work. Know what to say and what not to say. Know how to say it and how not to say it. Know the way that if you say it, it will provoke her to anger. And know the way if you say it, it will provoke her to love. Stay with the one that will provoke her to love. Know how to relate. Know how to talk. Know when to talk. Know when not to talk. You should study her and understand how she functions. And then relate with her in the best way. So you can have peace also. You can have peace. What is this life about? You don't have peace. Always your house is ba 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 ba. You will die young. Give her peace and have peace. Let's all have peace. Let me also have peace. Don't be the reason why I am always sitting down in the office. Weary me. You weary me. You wear me out. The time I will have used to pray and think and study the Bible. I'm spending it to be doing unnecessary counseling. Counseling that is as a result of both of you failure to study the word of God. Don't do that. Don't be the reason for weariness. You must know things about your wife. You know, things about menstrual period, 
the hair of a woman, you must know that her hair is different from your own. You must know that a woman's lips must be fine. You must know all those things. Not to tell her, can't you see the way I've kept my mouth? You to keep your mouth like that. No, there's a difference between a man's lips and a woman's lips. I'm teaching here. Why are you looking at me? You must know that a woman needs more time to dress than a man. Because a man is straight. Fia, fia. <laughs> Honey, where are you? Let's go. <laughs> no, a woman is not fia, fia. <laughs> a woman has all kinds of corners and bends. She has to drive through and negotiate well. Your own is direct entry. Fia, fia. Shed trouser. Comb. Some men don't even comb because they have been blessed with the gift of natural combed hair. You just wear the cloth and you're your way. Most men don't use cream because we're all, all naturally creamed. After you finish bath, you look at the mirror, your face is shiny. <laughs> so no need for cream. If you touch cream some more, you just touch some more. You rub your hand. Madam, let's go. No, a woman needs time. Because that's the way her make is. She takes her time, negotiates, she will touch this, touch that. She has to do her hair. That takes a lot of time. Some of them, their dress needs help. And if they don't have help, they can sit down there trying to help themselves for one hour. Just help. And the husband, instead of coming to assist, I'm waiting downstairs. Po, po, po. <clears throat> Po, po, po. Ah, okay now. Let him. You come and see us sitting down. Ah, are we not going? We're going now. I'm trying to put this thing. It's not responding. You go back again. Po, po, po. Ah, you're wasting the time. When you can just assist. And quickly, two of you can go. Teaching good. You don't have to be insensitive. You have to discern. Find out what's going on. Be patient. Assist them. They'll do their hair. They'll do their face. They'll do their makeup. They'll do all the things and everything. You wait. So sometimes it's, it's easy if you assist them. Assist them. Be a part of it so that you can facilitate things. And even preempt things. Okay, I know you need this. I know you need that. Okay, what about that? That's right. What about that? Sharp, sharp, sharp. We're out of the place. Please, that's very important. You dwell with them according to knowledge. And then the Bible says, giving honor to your wife. And the knowledge is the knowledge of natural things. Giving honor to your wife means respect. Then he now said something that many people don't understand. That your prayers be not hindered. He's not saying God will not hear your prayers. He's saying that so that you are not, you don't misunderstand to a point where you cannot pray together. Because if there's tension, two of you can't pray together. And because of tension, you, you are hindered from praying. That's what he means. So when I have a great relationship with my wife, it has great impact on our Christian life. It has great impact on our Christian life. First Corinthians 7, 4 and 5 says we can pray together. First Peter 3, 7 says as heirs together of the grace of life. So you are first among equals. You are not greater. You are not better than your wife. Because she is your wife. You are only above her where? In marriage. Because... She is the wife, you're the husband. You're not better, you're not greater, you're not even more intelligent. So just love her as Christ loves the church. And in loving her, your wife, you must love her in considering her spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. Make sure you're taking responsibility to ensure that your wife is growing spiritually. Ensure that your wife is growing spiritually. 
Make sure your wife is growing spiritually. See to it that she's involved in Bible study. See to it that she makes note in services. Sometimes after service, ask her, let me see what you were writing. Read her note. Make sure she's involved in the house system. Don't train your family in rebellion. Don't train your family in disobedience because it will haunt you down one day. When we give instruction in church, make sure your family is first to obey. I am my household. We will serve the Lord. Because your children were in church when we said everybody be in a house church and they saw you ignore it. They saw you treated being in a house church as nothing. They saw that you don't even attribute any importance to what Papa is saying. So what you're training your children to do is that they should not take whatever comes from the pulpit serious, including preaching. That anything pastor says is secondary. It is useless. That's what you're telling your children by action. And they are watching very intelligently. A time will come when the chiefs are down. When they have disobeyed you enough, you now say, I will take you to pastor. <laughs> they will just laugh. Pastor is the most unserious person. They won't listen to anybody because you taught them by action that pastor means nothing. But when I give announcement and you get to me and say, everybody, you heard what Papa said? Tomorrow we're all in the house center. Everybody. And we'll be there on time. Your children know that, ah, if it is coming from the pulpit, it is not something to joke with. So it will be easy for the word of God to penetrate their hearts. And it will be easy for them to take the word of God serious and grow with reverence for God's word. Am I teaching here? When you obey instructions from the pulpit, you are not just the beneficiary. Your family is part of it. Your children are part of it. And as a responsible husband, a responsible father, and, and, and a responsible parent, you must make sure that you take the instructions that come from the pulpit where you are fed, where you are submitted to, very serious. Both for yourselves and for those that follow you. Beginning from your immediate family. That's very important. That's very, very important. Make sure your wife is involved in her responsibilities in church. Make sure she's committed. Make sure she's serving. Make sure she is in ministry. Make sure she's involved in discipling in people. All of that is your contribution to our spiritual growth. Because listen carefully. When we leave this world, we are not going to see Jesus as husband and wife. We are going to see Jesus as his children. And what we will be rewarded for is the service we did in the kingdom, not the service we did to our husband. So, after taking care of your family, you still owe Jesus a responsibility in his kingdom. Marriage was not by force. It has no reward with Jesus. The reward of marriage is here. So, don't say, because I'm a good wife, Jesus will reward me. Ta! Ta! Which Bible did you read? The reward Jesus will give you is what you have done in his kingdom. For the furtherance of the gospel. For the furtherance of the gospel. So after taking care of your home duties as a wife, you have to find a place in the kingdom of God and serve God. Be committed. And a husband must say to it that his wife is dutifully committed. Don't be nonchalant about your wife's like a dicical attitude towards the kingdom of God. It will get back at you very soon. Make sure your wife takes the things of God serious. Make sure she's committed. Make sure she's part of prayer. Make sure she's part of evangelism. Make sure she's part of discipleship. You must help her to the point where she can fulfill ministry. My wife is here. I have never stood on her way to serving God. Never. I have never stood on her way. Never. So you see to your wife's spiritual growth. Support her. Don't oppose her. Don't stop her. Anything that has to do with serving God, encourage her. Help her to do it. You must love her as Christ loves the church. Take care of her physical well-being. 
If she's not feeling well, attend to her. Don't ignore. There are husbands that ignore their wives. They just ignore their wives. They just ignore their wives. A wife is critically sick. You tell her, go and see the doctor. She's critically sick. To even move is a problem. And you're telling her to go. What kind of house are you? Because that's not a complete one. A complete one will have band. An incomplete one will just be a horse. No band. Recently I was ministering to a particular woman and her horse, this one was critically ill. They have to carry her and literally bring her because of the state of her sickness. And the next day they were to bring her to me for prayer. The husband told her to enter keke. The woman cannot walk. I don't know how she managed to enter the keke. They said the man said he has to go to work. Abandoned the wife. The wife came here. And because of her weakness, she couldn't even enter the office. She fell by the AC somewhere outside and just stayed there. Because she had no strength. And the husband had the mind to go to work. What kind of work? But if she's dead now, he will take two weeks for burial. He will leave work to do burial for two weeks. You see, misplaced mentality. Village mindset. Uneducated. Primitive mindset. Unschooled. Unexposed. Unenlightened. Dark mind. How can you let, let your wife? This is your wife. You don't care what happens to her. A man must take care of his wife's physical well-being. If she complains of a pain, attend to it. Make sure that pain complaint goes. He has to see the doctor. Arrange for her to see the doctor. That's part of being a husband. And if you, if you don't want her to see the doctor, you want to believe God with her, then by all means, give her the word of God, show her the word of God, and two of you stand in faith. But don't be careless. Because Christ will not be careless about us. He was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. He took our place. It is the job of a husband to take the place of his wife. The Bible says the husband is the savior of the body. The savior of his wife. You save her. You speak over her. You stand in faith with her. If I'm teaching good, shout I hear you. Thank you, Lord. I say, thank you, Lord. Remember, these instructions are for the born-again people in Christ. And we can do these things because we are born of God. When there's a problem in your home, the first place you go to is not marriage counseling. The first place you go to when there's a problem in your marriage is not marriage counseling. Go to the word of God. Go to the word, both of you. Find out what does the word say about this situation. If you do that all the time, you will never need counseling. You will never, except if you are ignorant of the word of God. Then you can come, let us show you. Because at the end of the day, marriage counseling is we showing you the word of God. <laughs> is it not true? Is we showing you the word of God. That's what marriage counseling is. So if you too can see the word of God for yourself, you may never need marriage counseling. Now, let me emphasize a point here because in the first service, we talked about forgiveness. You know, I have discovered that some men find it difficult to forgive their wives. A man that finds it difficult to forgive his wife is either he himself has not received forgiveness from Jesus or he is suffering from a mental condition. He's suffering from identity crisis. I have seen husbands who say to me, I cannot forgive my wife. I have made up my mind. She must go. She must go. Go where? The marriage is over. What? A new heart I will give to you. A new spirit I will put within you. I will take away from you the stony heart and give you what? Every child of God has a heart of flesh. 
There is no condition in your marriage that warrants a hard heart. Except you are not born of God. Except you are not born of God. And sometimes when I even look at the situation between the husband and wife, it's not even what is worth wasting time on. It's not. And let me tell you, if you think by divorcing your wife and marrying another one, it will be okay. When you marry the second one, the same thing that broke the first one will break the second one. And once you start enjoying divorce, you will never stop. The moment you start enjoying it, you do the first one, you enjoy it. You do the second one, you get away with it. That is how the process will continue. Because you will no more be resilient. You will no more be determined. You will no more be enduring. You will no more be long-suffering. You will no more be patient. Once the marriage doesn't look like what you want, you just say, ah, it's okay, I'll leave it. i leave it. I'll leave it. What the word of God teaches us is perseverance. As a good soldier of Christ, endure hardship. Endure hardship. So if you're in a marriage that is not working, make up your mind to make it work. No matter what you have to endure. Endure it until it works. A guy came here, a pastor. He said, Dr. Damina, I want to divorce my wife. I said, why? He said, because everywhere I've gone for counseling, they told me my wife is a witch. And I know she is a witch. How many of you know there are pastors who delight in those kind of things? They use it to control people's families. So I said to him, yes. You're a pastor, right? He said, yes. I said, very good. He said, my, well, my wife is a witch. I said, oh, no, she's not only witch. She is witchcraft. She is the headquarter of witchcraft. He said, do you know her? I said, no, I don't know her, but from the way you have spoken, I can discern. I, I have, my spiritual eyes have opened. Your wife is the headquarter of witchcraft. He said, mm, you are the correctest man. You even saw before. So that means you know what I'm going through. I said, very well. He said, so what do you say? I said, no. <laughs> what I have to say is very simple. What did you say you are again? He said, I'm a man of God. What is your ministry? To set the captives free, right? He said, yes. To free people from the bondage of Satan. He said, yes. To preach the gospel and bring people to freedom. He said, yes. I start with her now. <laughs> your wife <laughs> is the first crusade ground. Set her free clear her, use her to prove that you have a ministry. Then anywhere you go to preach, give testimony of her first before you preach. He looked at me like this. <laughs> that's to say you have got me. I said, that's what to do. He left my office angry because he doesn't want the truth. If your wife is a devil and you're a man of God, free her from being a devil minister to her. The same way you will minister to another person's wife or another person's child or another person's husband. They are all like your wife. Don't tell me you have a ministry and you cannot put it on your wife. No. I pray for the sick, they get healed. But the first people I pray for in my house, they are here, they are, they are, they are here where I'm talking. My family, I lay hands on them. I don't allow the devil to jump around my family like it's a football field. No way. No. Once the devil is trying something in my house, I take authority. I take authority. I refuse him. Not under my word. Not under my word. I take authority. A mama does what she needs to do as a wife. She gives us the, 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 the healthiest food we can find. The healthiest. I can tell you confidently, under her watch, none of us have been admitted in the hospital ever. No, not my children, not me. We've never had an occasion to sleep in any hospital for a night. Not even a night. No. Because she sees to it that we eat healthy. Mama can read for Africa when it comes to diet. She can read for Africa. She knows the combinations. Medical doctors salute her. Even though she didn't read it. She knows what to come back. The moment you say, I have a pain here, mama will say, one, two, three, put it there. It will be okay. When you take it, it's okay. We have never had to go and sleep in the hospital anywhere. She ensures that our nutrition is okay. You see me jumping here like a five-year-old boy. 
Somebody say, Papa, what is your secret? <laughs> Over somewhere there. <laughs> yes. That's a secret. And that's the job of a wife. She ensures we don't eat nonsense. We don't. If you hear my, my children complaining at any time of headache or pain, know that they ordered food from outside house. The moment they start complaining, the first question is, did you order food from outside? Yes. Okay, stop. Flushing will start. That day we will flush. Everybody will flush from the food we ate outside. After the following day, everybody is fine. Why? Because she studied our bodies, she studied our composition, and I've discovered which foods work for us, and she gives us those foods. We eat... I don't like staying outside my home beyond two days. Two days is too much. And the reason is not because of anything. It's simply because people don't know how to handle me outside my home. They don't know how to handle me. First of all, my diet is funny. I'm not a normal person. <laughs> you can't do what I do and be normal. Is it true? I'm not a normal person. That's why I don't eat out with people. Because the things they will order is not what I will order. When they finally order and I order my own, I'll be looking like I'm not a human being. So there's no point we go and eat out. Except I'll just drink water or tea with a few biscuits and that's it. But food, no. I don't trust anybody with my food like I trust her. So I don't stay out too long. In case your food is not working for me, I can fast for two days and still be alive. <laughs> and come home very fast to recover all. That's the way it should be. A husband should be in a hurry to go home because he knows everything he needs for his life is at home. Not that a man is hanging out till 2 a.m. He wants a wife to sleep first so he can have peace. Then he will stroll into the house and come and sleep. No. Home should be home. A woman should make home home. Make the house conducive. Make it comfortable. Let there be peace in the house so that when the husband comes, there can be peace. And also the husband should make the home a home. Because if you're always beating your wife, that home is no more a home. No husband has a scriptural right to strike his, his wife with his hand. No husband has that. No husband. That's intimidation. That is witchcraft. Intimidation is witchcraft. That means what you want to tell her, you don't trust words to do it. You want to force it by beating. is abuse. And woman, don't allow a man beat you more than once. And even that once, he has to pay for it. Make sure he pays for that one careless slap that he gave you. Make sure he pays to the last dollar. Not naira, dollar. Don't let him. Don't let him. A man mistakenly beat you once and you keep quiet. He will beat you five more times. From the first day he lifts his hand up, tell him it is written. Touch not my anointing. Do my prophets know how. <laughs> Do my prophets. Some say, but women can talk. Hey, that's why you're a man. Women are gifted to talk. Men are gifted to have shock absorbers. When she tell you, eat your stupid man, see your head. Nonsense. Bastard. Bastard. Mm. Mm. If it's getting too much, walk away. Walk away. And when you walk away, look for a brother. Who has Holy Ghost and chill with him, pray in tongues, fellowship in the world, build spiritual strength. Come back home. Hey, darling, <laughs> I missed you for the few minutes I was away, man. You know, you're the best woman God ever gave me. You're precious, you're glorious. You will keep her mouth quiet, use goodness and shut her up. Don't use slap. It's God's goodness that leads men to repentance, not God's wickedness. Am I teaching good? 
I won't tell you what I'm not doing. I'm doing it in my heart. I, I've never, I've, my children have never seen me by any mistake abuse my wife either physically or orally. Never. That my mouth mistakenly will open and tell my wife, idiot, it has never happened. Never. Never. I won't teach you what I don't do. You are the prophet of your family. You must speak good things because you will harvest it. No matter the anger. And there are times I get angry. There are times I get angry. Sometimes mama is gifted. She gives me ba 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 ba. I take it. <laughs> yes, sometimes it happens. It's part of it. Sometimes the fault is mine. Sometimes I provoke her, not deliberately, but it just happens. And then the response comes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. You will never hear me say, stupid woman, from where now? Oh, eh, eh, never. Never. If I have that, energy, that much energy, I will use it when I'm preaching. Shut fire! <laughs> Glory to God. God, I feel like poop, poop, poop. Shut poop. Somebody do poop, poop, poop. I will finish it here so that when I go home, I will cool down. <laughs> if I'm teaching good shout, I hear you. Take it in, in good faith. Be a good man. Anything she tells you will not hold. But your own way, you speak it. Because you are the head. You've got to be careful. Mind your words. Because she's under, you're over. Mind your words. Your children are under, you're over. Mind your words. Mind your behavior. As a husband, you have the greatest responsibility. If a house is successful, the man is a first suspect. When the family in Eden broke down, even though God knows it was wife Eve's idea, who did God look for? Anywhere there's a marital problem, the first suspect is who? The husband. Everywhere there's a marital problem, the first suspect is the husband. Adam, where are thou? Adam, God knew it was Eve. There's nothing that took him by surprise. But he has to hold the head responsible. So as a husband... You must be responsible enough to be held responsible. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Don't keep malice. In our home, we don't understand malice at all. Mama is the, is the wrongest person for malice. She can't even keep malice. If she's not happy with something, we must talk about it now. Now, now, now. Honey, come, 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 come. Come, come, come. I'm praying. Wait first. Let prayer wait. Come, come. We have to sort this matter up. Bible says if you have a gift to the altar and you remember your brother is not happy, drop it first. Come, come, come. We have to set. No malice in my house. No malice. And we are not pretending. Immediately we will fix it. Everybody will continue. We have, my children know they have never seen me and their mother that we are keeping malice for one day. They've never seen it in my house. Sometimes they even look at us and think whether we are pretending. They look at their mother. And look at me. Okay. You people are okay. Yes, we're okay. Okay. It's true. And we're not pretending. We're just being ourselves. If we're not happy, we talk. We talk about it quickly. And we resolve it. We don't let it linger. Because when you allow it linger, you've created room for Satan. Satan will come and sit there where there is space. And he will begin to manipulate things. Never give the devil room. Refuse to be malicious in your family. Deal with it instantly and resolve it there. And if two of you cannot resolve it, seek for your pastor immediately. Pastor, we have a misunderstanding. This is what I said from the word of God. I quoted one, two, three scriptures for my husband. He has no scripture and he's insisting. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> you don't have scripture. You are a fast three. And you're still, <laughs> and you're still insisting. Shut up, my friend. Are you not ashamed? You don't even get scripture. Even if now, why your scripture? You know if you quote. See you. <laughs> Go and do what your wife has said. See, she has three scriptures. <laughs> Everything must be backed by the word of God. Mama and I, from the day we got married, we decided that anything we cannot find in scripture, 
will not suffice in our home. So, in our home, it's scriptures that rule. Honey, we have to do this. Why? It is written. It is written. I had to study the Bible well and look for all the scriptures that will support my position. We have to do this. Why? Because it is written. One, two, three, four. Okay, you have it. That's the way it works in my house. And the word of God is final authority. So, we don't have an issue that we cannot resolve because we have the, work, the manual for wisdom. We don't refer to proverbs in the village. We don't look for traditional sayings in our village. My people say, we don't have such things in my house. In my place, they say, no, we don't have it. Well, what does the word say? The word of God is final authority. Can somebody shout, I hear you. Am I a blessing this morning? In closing, as I close this, have I dealt with men enough? I have not dealt with husbands enough. Ah, women, just because I ask you to submit, you own only submit, I talk. <laughs> Don't worry, we're still going to deal with a number of things on marriage, but I want to quickly get to children and parents, then I'll come back to marriage because there's still a number of things to do with in marriage, even as it has to do with single people and all of that. The whole of this week, next week, we're talking it, so, you know, we can't finish all in one service. Can I have a powerful Amen. And we can do these things because we are born of God. Amen? We can do it because we are born of God. Don't first of all blame your wife. Ask yourself. When there is a problem in your marriage, please, if you are making those, take this one. It's a good place to close this service. When there is a situation in your home, ask yourself. Don't, don't blame your wife. Don't blame your husband. The moment there is a misunderstanding, it doesn't matter where it comes from. The first thing to ask yourself before engaging is, am I walking in love? Have I been praying? Have I been praying for my wife or for my husband? Have I lived in forgiveness? Do I tolerate her? Am I walking in understanding? You ask yourself such questions. After you have ticked yes, 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 yes to all the boxes before you engage. Don't first of all look at your spouse's responsibility. First of all, cross-check your own responsibility and be sure you have kept your own part of it. A wife will put, have I been submissive? Am I respectful? Am I honoring my husband? Have I done my domestic responsibilities well? As a man, am I caring? Have I been... Doing my responsibilities at home, am I showing re re tolerance as Jesus shows? And for single people in the service, begin to train yourself to walk in love. As a single person, begin to train yourself to tolerate people, help people take care of themselves. Begin to look after people, be responsible as a single person because that same training is what will work for you in your home. It's a divine responsibility. And you must make up your mind today never to model your marriage after the world. Model your marriage after Christ. Model your marriage after Christ. Don't copy Oprah Winfrey. Don't copy all those people. Copy Christ. Christ is your model. Christ is your standard. Thank you Lord Jesus. Every man in this house say, I have capacity because I am born of God to love my wife, tolerate my wife, and care for my wife, and honor my wife. I have capacity to help my wife be the best person she can ever be in life. I'm not intimidated by the success of my wife. I'm not inferior to anybody. I have what it takes to be the best husband, and I'm committed to being the best husband that it ever produced. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Everybody stand on your feet. That's a good place to close this service. Hallelujah. I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush in another few minutes to answer questions. And those of you that have questions, shoot them by email because we continue to ask the counselor tomorrow even as we continue teaching on relationships. All right? Amen. Lift your right hands to heaven, everybody. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly perfect, perfectly furnished unto every good work. 
I ask that as we keep learning and growing, your word continues to mold us. We are all learning, relearning and growing. Thank you that everybody is being enriched in this place. Thank you that you're equipping every man, every woman, our single people. And we rejoice that your word is nourishing us. And I decree and declare that any home here that may be having challenges, be healed in the name of Jesus. Satan, get your hands off that family in the name of Jesus. And I decree the grace of God is, suppl is, is supplied to your home, supplied to your relationships. And I decree that every family here enjoys the goodness of Jesus, enjoys the grace of Jesus, and enjoys the healing power of God. Thank you for your peace upon us. Thank you for your blessing upon this house. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Can I have a better amen than that? Now listen to me, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., I'll begin teaching parents, family, I mean parents and children, children and parents. And you don't want to miss it. You know, if I had my way, I would have asked for all the young people in this church and all the children to be in church tomorrow so that I can teach it to them directly and answer their questions without the parents being present. If I had my way, I would love to do that. But you see, I didn't announce it in the first service because I would have wanted all the young people, both first and second service, to be here tomorrow and all children. And then I will teach and then I will answer their questions. But I will still do that. I will still do that. Maybe not today. Maybe next Monday or something. I will still do that. So when I announce it, parents, bring all your children, bring all your your, your, your people, young people and all young people in church if you're not married, you're a young person find your way in so we can talk about this thing about parents and children so you can ask your questions freely without your parents being around and watching you you can see what bothers you and we can really have some interaction between me and the young people and children don't you think it's nice? yeah, we should do something like that so maybe next Monday after this Sunday we'll do that kind of session with everybody in the house, amen? I said amen are we blessed? Get a good offering. We want to give in honor of God's word. Every time we hear the word of God, we give in honor. Those of you watching online on television, those of you listening on radio, Mr. Michael Bush is going to read the banking details so you can give your offerings. But thank you for supporting our ministry and helping us to do the things that we do all over the world. All right, the banking details are there. You can go ahead sending your offerings. And everybody else in the building, lift your offerings up to heaven as a sign of worship to Jesus. Father, we honor you with our offerings. And we thank you for the privilege to give today. Our offerings are a sweet smell before you. And we thank you for the privilege of being blessed with your word. And I ask that everyone here, your needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you for the blessing today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. I didn't hear that amen at all. Amen. Hey guys, listen to me. All of you online on television, don't go away. I'm joining Mr. Michael Bush and we continue with Ask the Counselor. And I look forward to seeing every one of you every evening, 6 p.m. GMT plus one, all through next week and the week after next like that until we finish the series. And you don't want to miss any day of it. Invite more people to be part of it as we continue to nourish ourselves in our relationships to be the best that God has on the planet. Looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow at 6 p.m. GMT plus one. And until then, let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Amen! Amen. Woo! Glory to God, I tell you. you. Anywhere. By this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email Power City Office at gmail.com.
Okay. Thank you for staying tuned. We start this segment of the program right away with the traditional announcements that come at this point of the program. So, uh, bank details, the account name is Power City International, but of course, there are three banks. There's FCMB, the Zenith, and there is UBA. On this edition, we start off with the last. 139-26465, 139-26465, that's for UBA. Power City International remains the account name. So, two for FCMB, 2982-6828, 2982-6828. Power City International Steel, so to for Zenith, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. For sponsorship, just dial plus 234 if you are doing from outside the country. Otherwise, it's 0803 275 or you email Dr. Ebel Damina at yahoo.com. Dr. There, of course, is DR. Okay, so any moment now, we'll just be launching because I'm um, looking forward to having Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina, by my side. But before it comes, let me just quickly tell you, my name is Michael Bush. I'm the anchor. I'm super excited to be that for you and hopefully would be that for such a long, long, long time. Okay, so the man of the moment is here, the set man, the man that God sent to guide all of us through his word. The Christocentric man, and you know, prolific author, um, international televangelist, also on the radio, 11 hours every day. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So good Global to see Baba, you so today. Global Baba, so nice to see you too. Wow. So, so nice to see you. You look good, man. You look better, Global Baba. Just, uh, you're reporting for... You just keep... <laughs> you just keep pushing these things. Oh, no, Global Baba. <laughs> so, so nice to see so you. So good to see you. Okay, so Global Baba, um, we're just waiting for the ritualistic... A prayer that sure, um, sets sure, us on the way. Sure, let's pray. Father, we rejoice that all over the nations of the earth, the truth of your word is growing and disciples are being raised every day. This gospel is continually preached, proclaimed, and we rejoice that ministers of the gospel are being equipped. The word of God is growing mightily and prevailing in nations. We want to thank you for Kwaibom State, our governor, his cabinet, public and civil servants of this state, private individuals, businessmen. Thank you for grace that is upon this land. A quiet bomb is making progress. And we thank you that the government are enabled by grace to create an enabling environment in this land for the gospel to keep thriving. And we decree that in our nation and all of Africa and the continents of the world, the word of Christ continues to grow mightily. Many are turned to righteousness. And we thank you that barriers are terminated and ministers of the gospel are granted utterance and boldness to preach the word like never before. And we give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here we go from 98 Wangiba Road in the heart of Uyo. 98 Wangiba Road, by the way, is the global headquarters of Power City International. This program is uh, for you, two hours every day. And what a blessing it's been for everyone worldwide. So Global Power will spend the night in the United States of America. That's in Northern America. Uh, yesterday, and so we're starting there from anonymous entry. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. I'd like to thank you for the sacrifices you both make to impart knowledge to our generation. Global Baba, you said the other day that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are so-called in relation to redemption, that God is one. My understanding of one is inseparability. Then the four Gospels predominantly shows that Jesus was anointed of the Holy Spirit. Does this mean, therefore, Global Baba, that Jesus Christ has a separate personality and entity from the Holy Spirit? Please help clarify this for me. Thank you so much. Well, again, like I always advise, just take it easy with trying to understand the Trinity. Understand all other concepts. Understand salvation. What does salvation mean? Understand redemption. Re understand righteousness. Understand spiritual growth understand ministry, understand every other thing. In the process of understanding all of that, you will come to a place of revelation where you really understand what the Trinity concept in redemption is. When Jesus came to the earth, the Bible says he stripped himself of all privileges that makes him God and took on the form of a servant for the purpose of saving you. All of this Trinity concept is an expression of the extent to which God is willing to go to save a sinner. It's, a, it's, 
is a demonstration of the love of God towards humanity. That's what it really is. Okay, another anonymous entry still from the United States of America in the northern part of the Americas. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. In one of your teaching series, two kinds of righteousness. Global Baba, you said righteousness is tied to the resurrection of Christ. Then Paul described the law as holy in Romans 7, 12, as spiritual in Romans 7, 14, and used the phrase, the righteousness of the law in Romans 8, 4. Furthermore, the book of Hebrews described the law as false finder. At what point is the law holy, spiritual, and righteous? Well, no again, barber. words must be used within context. The law is holy in the sense that the law is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law says you shouldn't hurt people. The law says you shouldn't do things that are wrong towards people. That's what the law is all about. There's nothing wrong with it. However, the law does not have the power to empower the person to whom it is given to to observe the dictates and the demands of the law. That is the weakness. That is the weakness of the law. So by, by so doing, the law puts you at a place where you have faults. And then not only have faults, it defines for you punishment for the faults of not keeping the law. That's exactly what the law did. And the reason why the law was given is because of unbelief. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts. So it's because of the state of a man's heart. Which means the law is a reflection of the state of men's hearts. So the law is holy or righteous in the sense that the law demands for things that are not wrong. But the people it is making the demand on don't have what it takes to keep the law. That's why Jesus kept the law, fulfilled the law, took the law out and gave you his righteousness by faith devoid of works. Praise God. So from one part of the continent of the americas that's the continent of the americas we're still going to stay in that same part that's still the northern part but a different country canada hello global baba and michael bush the two warriors actually global baba how can he say i'm a second warrior i'm only a half warrior I should have been one and a half warriors well maybe you know. when the person defines to us what warrior is in the context no, we know who the warrior is global baba he doesn't need to define <laughs> You know, oh, so I'm just okay. half. I'm just. I see, uh, I see. I'm just supporter. I see. Okay, so thank you for your life, Global Baba, and for your ministry. May God's grace continue to multiply on you and your family. Amen. My question is from First John five sixteen, and it says, "What is the sin which is unto death?" Well, again, like I always say, get Soteria season five. It will explain in details for you what sin unto death and sin not unto death is. But like I simply explain for the purpose of a teaser. Sin unto death is the rejection of Christ. Sin not unto death are wrongs you do against your brothers. Okay, Matty, in Canada, I hope you got that. So we're leaving this part of the continent now to the other part. Suriname is a small country on the northeastern coast of South America. Here we come. Hello, Global Baba. My name is Robert. I write from Suriname. Global Baba, your teachings are a blessing to me, but I have a question. If God is the God of love, why does he say, Esau, I hate? Oh, it was a concept. It was a concept of what we call the doctrine of election. It was just a mode of communication. That means, and when he says, Esau, I hate, he, Jacob, I love, he added that the purpose of election may stand. That means that God's election will not be dependent on works. It will not be dependent on works. You, you will not qualify. Because if it is for qualification, he should love Esau being the firstborn, being the senior. But he loves Jacob. To show you that it is not about who came in first, who didn't come in first. The purpose of election in Christ is that whosoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's just by way of teaser, how much I can explain to you here. But when you get the material, Soteria 5, you will have all the exegesis with further explanation. The United Kingdom, be nice. By the way, somebody is here from the United Kingdom. Yes, so it's so it's nice. Joy, it's Feels yeah. nice. Sure. Hello, Global Baba. Colossians 2, 3 says, In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. For emphasis, Global Baba, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in him. Surely, if the Bible says all, there must be treasures of wisdom of business in him. This is not always from the world. Your thoughts, Global Baba? Not my thoughts. You, uh, I don't have thoughts. But what you just said really doesn't, it doesn't count at all. God's wisdom is not business. God's wisdom is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. That's God's wisdom. If you want business wisdom, go to business school. Go to Harvard. 
Go to London Business School. Go to Lagos Business School. There they will give you the wisdom. Remember, God didn't create money. Money is man's creation. So since man created money, man sets the rule for the operation of money. You know, so if you want money for, for business, go to business school or look for a mentor who is good in business and money to mentor you. In Christ, what we have is the wisdom of his salvation, justification, redemption, and his plan to save mankind. We're flying out of uh, the UK. We're heading to Spain. Meanwhile, this caller. Hello. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Hello. Yes. Hello. Your name, where you're calling from? Yeah, good evening, sir. Evening. Bless you. Uh, good evening, sir. Evening. Good Bless you. Go ahead. Just go ahead. You have 30 seconds. I am Mr. Norris, sir, from from Circuit. You know, time of year. Okay, go ahead. Uh, there is an issue that I'm having in my family and in my daughter. And I want God to help me to settle my issues. What's the issue? I will see with you, sir. My daughter, my third daughter, just confessed that she has been given a wish in order to destroy my family and the wife that I have in my house. Okay. <laughs> so I don't have any option but to make sure I take it for that time upon any prayer. Okay. And then I have been having financial difficulties. We have been for over a long time. She confessed that she has been depressed. Okay. Ignorance is a problem. Mm. L listen, some of those things, children just say it out of fear or because they know that's what you expect them mm. to say mm. so they can get your sympathy. There's nothing like giving a child witchcraft. It's ignorance and it's actually a mentality of illiteracy. There's nothing like that. So my advice to help you, since you don't know better, both you and your daughter, come to Uyo Power City International. We will open the Bible and show you what I'm saying now and then pray for you and your daughter. Bless you. The mentality of illiteracy. To Spain now. Greetings, Dr. Abel Damina. I'm Joyce C. Peters. I write from Spain. Why did you pick that word? No. <laughs> no, Baba. You know, you just drop, uh, you, just, you know, you keep dropping things as if you're not the one dropping them. I mean, it's, it's in my soul, straight, the mentality of illiteracy. You know, okay, so I'm Joyce you know Peters. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's like people just come and say, they say, I have water spirit. Mm. They say, I have a banjo. It's lack of proper teaching. And it's because it's bad pastoring. It's bad pastoring. And we need to correct it. Because if we don't correct those things, that mentality will keep our people down for too long. Okay, so Global Baba, we have not even finished from one, you have added another one. So, um, the mentality of illiteracy and then bad pastoring. Have you heard that one before? Bad pastoring. Bad yeah. pastoring, yes. okay. Bad pastoring. Okay, so I hope just call us who just come and rescue <laughs> me. Okay, but um, I'm Joyce Peters, I write from Spain, Global Baba. My husband was tested positive for COVID-19 today, and we fear for our four-month-old baby. Please join faith with us and pray for our quick recovery. Thank you, Global Baba. You and everyone in your family, your baby and everyone is covered, kept. COVID is totally rendered useless Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for victory. Amen. And healing. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. From Spain to Sweden, may the peace of the Lord be with you, Global Baba, and the intercontinental Mr. Michael Bush. First, I want to thank the Lord Jesus who uses you to spread the gospel. Thanks for the wonderful eye-opening sermons you give us every day. May God use you even more. I live and work in Sweden. Global Baban would be grateful if there is a church that you can recommend here in Stockholm. We'd also like to receive information if there is an opportunity to go to your Bible school online. Thank you. That it in Sweden. Wow, yes, there is. We have an online Bible school, but you need to send us a mail to that effect. And we'll make sure our office responds to you, even with the campus. They will give you details on how to connect our people in Sweden. Bless you. Amen. Okay, so from Sweden, let's uh, fly to Africa. Just close our home, Sweden. Uh, from Sweden to Zimbabwe. My name is Love More Mavata. I arrived from Shurigi in Zimbabwe. I'm a 42-year-old man, and I got saved in 2011, Global Baba. Since then, I'm still in the faith. 
and having received the call of God in July 2010, I desired to know and to grow in the knowledge of Christ. It is still of my heart to sit down and be taught the word that I might grow in the knowledge of Christ and the true gospel so that I can fulfill my purpose. Until one day, as I was scrolling through the gospel channels and came across KLN TV and heard this man of God, Dr. Damina, after that I developed a desire to be mentored by Dr. Damina. I felt in me that this is what I was lacking. I would love to be a student and his son in the faith if he could accept me as one. My heart's desire will be fulfilled if I possess this knowledge of Christ and will not be ashamed to share with others. Thank you. Faithfully, love Mom Avata in Zimbabwe. Wow, praise the Lord. We, we, we thank you for reaching out. Our office will respond to you and help you on how to get in contact with our men mentoring academy and all of that. Bless you. Amen. Another caller? Hello. Yes, this is a person who is in Crossy Fire on. I want to thank Dr. Odemina and Dr. Bush for opening my eyes to God's book. Uh, especially the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is the law. Why the, the New Testament is freedom? And uh, secondly, my friend, when I was asking him, when he was asking him, like, God does not kill. He said, God kills. So he gave me a book of Genesis 13, 7 to 10. And uh, secondly, my pastor said, when he was drawn away from God, God will always make him to get accident from one place to another until he came up to be a pastor. So I asked him one thing that is it that God wants to bring him back to me? And later I come and do this thing for you. He cannot answer it well. So please explain the simple uh, matter. Um, well, well, I can't explain enough for you in this broadcast. So what you will do is Order for my teachings, the full teaching of the Misunderstood God series is part one, part two, part three, part four, part five. The series of the Misunderstood God. Order for it, sit down like a student and go through it so that you are better equipped to help people like your pastor and the other pastor who said God punished him with accidents. Then when he became a pastor, the accident stopped. Something is not right somewhere. But you can't help him until you know better. So order for the series. Bless you. Okay, so from Zimbabwe, flying straight to Lesetho, where the usual suspect is on call. That is Leloko Motebe, and he writes, Lobo Baba, I'd like to thank you for continuing to feed us the word of God. I'm grateful because since I joined your live sessions last week, my understanding of the word has increased. I've been reading the Gospels as you instructed us. I've realized that these books are the same and tell the same stories, only that you find slight differences here and there in their stories or reports. Some, some you would find them using different terminologies, while others having other parts of the stories omitted. For instance, I tried to overlook, okay, but I tried to overlook them. But what took my attention was the story of Jesus casting demons into the head of swine. I couldn't overlook it because I saw a big difference between the stories. In the book of Mark and Luke, it is written that Jesus met one person who was demon-possessed, but in Matthew, it says there were two demon-possessed men from whom Jesus cast out demons into the swine. So I want to know, Lobo Baba, why they didn't tell us the same thing in these stories and others that I didn't mention here and which side got it right. He goes on to give us some, some scriptural references and concluded these stories are the same by their similarities. They all begin with Jesus coming to the country of um, dimensions, he immediately met a demon-possessed man. My second question, what kind of the feeling of the Holy Spirit is this in the verses uh, Luke 1, 15, 41, 67? I got confused because it didn't say the Spirit upon, but it said filled with the Spirit. And I thought besides Jesus, the Spirit within is only related or associated with the new birth in Christ. My last question, Global Baba, is based on this verse. Luke 7, 19, and John calling two of disciples to him sent Jesus sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Why then, Global Baba, did John ask Jesus if he was the one? Yet in the previous chapters, it was very clear that John knew who Jesus was. Thank you so much, sir. All right. Well, first of all, remember the accounts were eyewitness. So it is what Matthew saw that he wrote. It's what Luke and John saw that they wrote. And there could be differences depending on where they stood from to see what they saw. That's why it's eyewitness. And that's why... We don't build doctrine on eyewitness account. 
Um, Second question is about the what kind of the feeling of the Holy Spirit is this in the okay. verses? The feeling of the Holy Ghost is like in the Old Testament where the Spirit of God came upon people to do certain assignments. That's the kind of Holy Spirit. After the assignment, the Spirit left. That's the same thing that happened in the four Gospels until the resurrection. Then the Spirit came to stay in us. Okay, so we move from, let's say, to we go straight I think to, there's one more. Sorry. Okay, yeah, the last question is based on, okay, John calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus and says, uh, why do you need John? Are you the John? real one or do we yeah, look for sure. another one? Mm. Well, remember, John the Baptist, uh, they were cousins with Jesus and he didn't know that Jesus was Jesus until water baptism. Then when he got into difficulty, he expected that Jesus should come and rescue him. But Jesus did nothing about it. Remember, he, John, already said, I must decrease that he will increase. But when Jesus came, he didn't decrease. He was busy talking and <laughs> speaking to power and speaking to government. So they took him and put him in prison to chop off his head. His ministry had finished. He was supposed to decrease for Jesus to increase. So Jesus allowed him to face the music and he got angry and he said, go and ask him, is he the real one or should we look for another one? And Jesus sent the disciples back with evidence that he was the one. He opened blind eyes, commanded the lame to walk. When they saw miracles, he said, go and tell John what you see and what you hear, confirming that he was the one. So sometimes when people get into difficulties, they begin to doubt what they believe, especially if it didn't come, you know, by revelation knowledge. No, but that's so real. That's so touching. But, uh, no, I, I, I'm, I mean... What, why would Jesus uh, keep quiet like that for John? Was that even a good prayer? Because there are some pastors who say, oh, uh, that, uh, that prayer decrees for God. That He didn't need to pray that kind of prayer. No, it was a good prayer. What actually John was saying is that my ministry has finished. Okay. My ministry was to introduce Jesus. I have introduced him. It's over. I'm done. He should have just carried his briefcase and be following Jesus quietly. Mm. But he, he instead, he continued talking like one who is still relevant. Mm. And in the midst of his talk, he went and talked in the wrong context. <laughs> yeah, they cleared him out. <laughs> okay, to Ghana next. Uh, my name is Banzo Emmanuel. I'm from Ghana. Bless you, sir. Just love to say thank you for the labor of love for the body of Christ. Transformation is taking place in my life since I started listening to your teachings, Global Baba. Great grace abounds towards the ministry, sir. Amen. Thank you. Still from Ghana. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. I've been following Dr. Abel Damina's teachings for the past two months. He has really helped and shaped my Christian life. I want to know, Global Baba, which Bible version will you recommend if one wants to study the Bible? Also, if Jesus Christ is a Passover, why do we still take communion at church service? Finally, is Jesus in heaven with earthly body or a spiritual body? Regards, Nana from Ghana. Nana, there's no place to read. Read everything. Read from Genesis to Revelation or follow our Bible reading plan. You know, the last two weeks we were reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, in my family, we finished John. We're in Acts now. But on Sunday, I'm going to give the second plan for the next three months. So follow our reading plan. Secondly, your question is... Um, Passover. Passover. Well, ask those churches that are still doing it. Why are they doing it? But I will recommend for you before you ask them so that they don't give you scriptures you cannot explain. Order for my book on the communion table. The communion table. All right. Okay. And is Finally, Jesus in heaven with earthly body or with yes. spiritual body? Jesus is in heaven with glorified body. Glorified body. Glorified human body. Okay. Global Baba from Ghana. Quickly, quickly to Cameroon. Hello, Global Baba and Power City International Ministries. I want Dr. Abel Damina to pray for me to be born again and filled with the spirit because the way i've been listening to his messages and teachings i have come to realize probably i was born again out of fear or something but now i want to receive christ by his death by his gospel death burial and resurrection teachings that after hearing i'm born of god thank you dr ebel damina rich and Dosi in cameroon wow that's a good one well what we'll do is producer please make sure we reply him tonight and get his phone number so that somebody can minister to him tomorrow and, you know, pray for him to get saved and receive the Holy Ghost. Okay, I'm just wondering, are we done with a trip around Africa? Okay, so we head straight now to Lagos, Nigeria, close at home, dear Global Baba and Mr. Michael Bush. Let me begin by thanking you, Global Baba, for your commitment to the gospel and the training of millions all over the world. I encountered you five years ago where I was instructed in a dream to follow you as you would show me the way to go. Ever since then, those words have played out in my life and family, even as my children recognize your voice and your leadership. All my questions have been answered, and I'm continually glued to learning from you. My spirit man is always at attention whenever I hear your voice in whatever medium. 
I believe I speak for millions worldwide. May your ministry find greater expression all over the world, and may your voice be amplified on all continents of this blue marble planet. God bless you, sir. Warm regards, Johnson, Eko Surulele, Lagos, Nigeria. Amen. Thank you, Johnson. What a joy to hear from you and those wonderful testimonies. Praise God. From Lagos State in the southeastern part of Nigeria, we we'll go to central, north central Nigeria, Kwara State. That is the north central Nigeria. Yes, sure. Hello, Global Baba. My name is Johnson Peace. I arrived from Kwara State. I need you to guide me as my spiritual father. I'm working on a radio station as a junior ICT staffer, but as after I acquired my BSc certificate, I got promoted and I was chosen to head the department which I, where I work as a senior staffer. But the man has, uh, who has been my boss in that department before I was promoted, he was now asked to be my assistant, but he refused and started causing many problems, insisted that I can't be the head of the department, that even before I was appointed to be one of the staffers in that department, he's been working, and he concluded that we would quit that work that I can never head the department. He can never be my assistant departmental head because he headed the department before today. He submitted his resignation letter on the 6th of February, 2021. Global Abba, I need your prayer and guidance in this matter. Well, in the name of Jesus, you have direction, you have favor. Thank you, Father. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. From Quara State, we're hitting the south-southern part of the country by road, worry, Delta State, here we come. Dear Global Baba and the Intercontinental Mr. Michael Bush, greetings to you too and the presence of God continually be with you. Global Baba, I'm becoming a regular in asking questions and it's because I want to get the best. Last Tuesday, that is on the 8th of February, you referred to the 12 as being saved and later you said 11 received the gift of the Spirit taken into account of what happened to Judas Iscariot. Now my question is, Judas was saved with the other 11 and after he betrayed Jesus, did he not go to hell? Because Jesus said it was better he was not born the person that would betray the Son of Man. Matthew 26 verse 24. Is there any difference between being born again and being saved? If a born again Christian keeps committing fornication, adultery, kidnapping and all that was listed in Romans 1 verses 28 to 31, will he or she still go to hell? Romans 1 32. Thank you, sir. God bless you richly. Yemi, from Warwick, Delta State, Nigeria. Well, Yemi, I'm sure you didn't follow very well. We never said Judas was saved. In fact, I even said Judas was the son of perdition. That means he was not born again. So it is the 11 that were saved. And of course, remember, they became 12 again in the book of Acts because Matthias was added to their number. All right? So Judas wasn't saved. People that commit sin doesn't mean they are not saved. There are people who are saved, who are still growing, and they make mistakes here and there. Committing sin does not define salvation. Faith in Christ defines salvation. However, when you are saved by Christ, by faith in Christ, as you begin to grow in the knowledge of Christ, the consciousness of Christ begins to affect your lifestyle. I hope that helps you. Okay, Global Baba, from there, because of time and the lack of it, I'm trying to see, let me just switch over to... Potako River State, closer and closer to Akwaibum State, where we are broadcasting from. Hello, Global Baba. I'm Desra Mwipigi Darlington, arrived from River State. Sir, I've been listening to your teachings for about three months now, and I've begun to see and have a clear understanding of scriptures, knowing that the whole scripture only speaks about Jesus Christ and his finished work. Thanks so much, sir, for allowing God to use you to open the eyes of a generation on the finished work of Christ. God bless you abundantly and deliver you from unreasonable and wicked men in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay. Wonderful testimony. Absolutely. So, Global Baba, quickly, quickly, from River State, let's come to Akwaibom, and then we take through Abak. My eternal spiritual father, Dr. Abel Damina, my name is Moses Israel. I write from Abak local government area of Akwaibom State. Daddy, I came in contact with you in 2018. Since then, my life has, been, has not been the same. You begat me through your words of wisdom in the scriptures. Daddy, your words of scriptures got me saved. They equip me, they build me up for the ministry ahead. Daddy, I'm glad to tell you good news through your teachings. Miracle has broken out in my life and every way in my ministry and community. I've been able to lead my mother and my wife and others to Christ. Our Heavenly Father has graced me to be reconciled to him and to give the gift to others to be reconciled to him too. And that should be done on the basis of love. The love of Christ compels me to tell this truth to the world. Daddy, please, with all amount of respect and love I have for you in Christ, teach me. Be my mentor. Direct me on what to do. 
and so that glorious love of international ministries could grow until nothing else matters. Souls to be won by the medium of this body of Christ. Thank you, my spiritual father. I love you. God bless you richly. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. Everywhere. Just stay, keep following the teachings. Keep following and keep following. Okay. Global Baba, um, because of time again, of the lack of it, let's just come straight to the live uh, audience here. We're going to be spending the night in you. Yeah. Um, hello, Global Baba. My name is Inyeno Bong Subong. I promised I was going to carry this from the last edition. The tarrying at Jerusalem, was it for 12 or 11? Well, again, we always use 12, 11 interchangeably. But when we say 12, you know what it means. It means 11. But remember, there was, there was uh, Matthias added to the number of the, of, the, of the disciples, which made them 12 in number. So always also remember that fact, because that's important. Okay, so Minyan uh, Bong Subong rounds off. They're talking about heaven not being a planetary location. Where are the patriarchs and matriarchs after the physical resurrection? They're in heaven, but not a material location. Heaven is immaterial. What is the last days? What does it mean? Is the last days the same as end times? If not, what's the difference? Last days started from when Jesus rose from the dead. So we've been in the last days for 2,000 years now. Last days means at last. At last. That is like you give a promise to somebody and you fulfill the promise. The time you fulfill the promise is at last the promise is fulfilled. So in Bible language, that at last, they called it last days. Last days doesn't mean the end of times. Last days simply means at last, when God's promise was fulfilled. Okay, so please, Global Baba, my question is, if angels were not working, and or if angels don't work for God, why would God be sending them to human beings anytime he wants to talk to you know, us? Like he sent um, an angel to Mary. My name is Christian, Michael. Well, again, remember, if there was no man, there would be no need for angels. God is not sending them because he's helpless. He's sending them because they are a medium that God created to assist man. So angels are there because of man. Okay, does it mean that Jesus and the devil um, called the principality work together? Because the Bible says Christ is the head of principalities and power. Galatians 2.9. Please, sir. Uh, more, blah, 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 you know. And this is from Prophet Emmanuel Uyoko. It's my name. Okay. Head over all principalities and powers doesn't mean they are working together. It means he rules over all of them. And that's why you can cast them out. But again, remember, principalities and uh, principalities also used for angels. Angels are also principalities. So context will define what that principality and power in that context implies. Okay, just so that we leave no unfinished business, like, uh, Revelation 2, verses 7, 8. Are we able 20, to have that? 20, Revelation 20. Okay, Revelation 20, verses uh, Verse no, 7 and 8. Uh, no, I remember it. Okay. I thought you were seeing it uh, somewhere In the spirit, else. Okay. <laughs> I want a thousand years I expired. Satan shall be loosed out of the prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the, the four, four corners, corners of, of the earth, earth. Gog and Magog, Magog, to gather them together to battle, the, the number, number of whom be as the sand of the sea. Now, when you read like that, you will not understand anything. Mm -hmm. So my advice, get my teaching on the book of Revelation, part 1 to either 12 or 13. That whole teaching series will explain all of this to you with the background, the foundation. Remember, the book of Revelation is a book of heavy metaphors. So it needs a lot of explanation and teaching from doctrine to open up that understanding. Global Baba must go. Producer uh, and his production team, many thanks. My name is Michael Bush. Global Baba is here. Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So good to have you here again Fantastic. tonight. Remember, you know, we'll be back tomorrow. We love you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. We'll be back tomorrow. Remember to follow all our broadcasts tonight on all the various radio stations. Tomorrow, 11 to 1, uh, Radio Aquibom, 1 to 3, XLFM, 3 to 5, Vino you know, UFM. And we're back here, 6 to 8 p.m. on Comfort FM. You don't want to miss what God is sharing. Get more people to join tomorrow as we begin to explore the Antichrist. It's going to be an explosive one. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ and be blessed. Goodbye from Uyo, Nigeria. Amen.